All right, you need a Bible open to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, all right? Kind of a hard book to find towards the back. Go to Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and then start flipping back towards the front. You'll get to a couple books, and then you'll find this, uh, this book of Hebrews. We've been studying this. This is our seventh week in the book of Hebrews. We're kind of doing a, a week by week, almost chapter by chapter study. Uh, we're in chapter 10. We're going to go nine weeks on this, so there's two more weeks left of this. Um, but we're getting close to the end. And in chapter 10, there's kind of a big turn. A lot of the theological heavy lifting of the book of Hebrews has been done for us. And he starts making these statements that are more about action items. Let's you and I do these things. And you'll you'll find those when he says, let us do this, let us do that. And in chapter 10, verses kind of 22 through 25, there's three times where he says, let us do this. And we're going to talk about one of those this morning. One of those is this. He gives us the message, together is better than alone. Together is better than alone. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Together is better than alone. You and I know this instinctively, that life together is better than alone, but let, let me prove it to you. There's a guy at our church, um, he hurt himself, and his wife took him to the emergency room, and um, I didn't ask them to share this story, so it's going to be an anonymous story. Um, he got hurt, and the doctor there who was stitching him up said, wow, you're lucky to be married. Some single guys don't survive accidents. And he said that like three times. Well, you're lucky to be married because some single guys, they just don't survive accidents. And it it was odd. It struck the wife as odd. Like, are you saying that married men, like, they're more fortunate than single men? And she she was trying to figure this out. So she went home and researched this. And this is what she found. Here's your first slide. Single men on average die 17 years earlier than married men. You might ask the question, why? Why? Why do single men die earlier? Here's some stats that this survey revealed. Unmarried, divorced, and widowed men don't eat as well as married men. (laughs) Unmarried men, point number two, unmarried men are less likely to exercise and more likely to smoke, drink, uh, drink too much, and take part in risky behavior. To prove this, I'm just telling you, the most quoted saying of single men right before they die is, Hold my beer and watch this. (laughs) I will not ask for a raise of hands who have said those words and then done something that is video worthy. Um, Another point, married men are more likely to get regular medical care. Why is that? Because married men are nagged about going to the doctor. Don't say amen, guys, right now. It's not the, it will not benefit your relationship. Uh, married men also have better cognitive function and a smaller risk of Alzheimer's disease. It goes on to, to say this. Um, there's a big asterisk to all of this study. What, what they found is there was a British study of 9,011 civil servants that also showed that being in a stressful relationship or stressful marriage could increase the risk of heart attacks by 34%. It's suggesting that the positive benefits of being in a relationship and being married is only for happily married men. I'm just saying that together is better than alone, but together in a healthy way is way better than being alone. That's what this scripture is actually going to refer to as well. By the way, you know this already though, because a lot of us The reason why together is better is often because convictions don't last and commitments don't stick. (laughs) Have you ever made a private commitment? Uh, An anonymous uh, conviction rose up in you and you didn't tell anybody and you said, well, you know what, I'm going to do this. And it could be as simple as a New Year's resolution or a commitment to lose weight or to stop something that you thought you needed to stop. And it was one of those private decisions and for some reason it didn't stick. And part of that is because it was private and anonymous. I'm not going to spend any more time arguing that together is better than alone. I think we all know that. But the question is, why then do you and I often choose alone? Why do we choose to be private, unknown, or alone? I put seven reasons in your notes there. Just let me read to you a couple of them to you real quick. Uh, oftentimes, it's because we want to do it our way. We have a way that we like to do things, and therefore, we just want to do it our way. When I counsel couples who are getting married, if they get married later in life, that is one of the things that we have to sort through is, I've always done it this way, and, and my, my fiance has always done it this way, and we've spent decades doing it that way, and we just really want to do it our way. And that's, it, it's hard to figure out what's the way that we meld together, but 
if you're married, by the way, this isn't about being married or single. I'm just saying when you come to church, oftentimes we choose to be alone, private, and anonymous because we don't want anyone telling us how to do it. We want to do it our way. The second one, it's rather blunt. It's just easier to sin alone. (laughs) If people don't know about my sin, I'm just going to do it. And I know we've all made mistakes, right? You did something you didn't mean to. You didn't even realize you were doing it. Before you knew it, you did it. But for uh, some of us, we've premeditated the things that we're going to do wrong. We've thought about it. It's just easier to do it without anybody else knowing it, right? No one ever says amen to that. I get it. Uh, Third is just sometimes people wear us out. If you're an introvert, oftentimes just people wear you out. You're like, I just don't want to be around anybody. I know together is better than alone, but together means I have to be with people, and I'm my own best company. We get it, okay? People wear you out. Fourth, we don't enjoy the truth about us that our friends can help us see. Marriage is a great example of this. Like your spouse is a mirror of you and oftentimes when you're with them a lot, there's like this mirror held up in front of you. Hey, do you know who you are? This is who you are. And sometimes we don't like the reflection in the mirror. And so it's easier to be private, anonymous, and alone than it is to be with people. The fifth thing is this. People have let us down. They've hurt us. Raise your hand if someone's ever let you down or hurt you. The rest of you, you never raise your hand in church for anything. We've all been let down. We've all been hurt. Sixth thing, it might actually require us to change. Because it just gets embarrassing with people when we've said we're going to change and we're going to do something we don't. And we'd rather be alone because it might actually require us to change if we're with people. And here's the seventh thing, and maybe the most powerful. We're afraid of rejection. What we're afraid of is if people knew past the outer us, that shell of us, that, that thing that we portray to people, our false self, the one that we wish we were but we're really not, if we actually let people inside of us to to know who we really were and they rejected that person, that's unbelievably painful. And we're afraid of that. Timothy Keller, a pastor, this is how he wrote it. He said, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. I'm gonna say that again. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. He goes on to say, but to be fully known and truly loved is a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. Question. When you look at that list, what about you? Is there anything on there that says, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I'm not as well known as as I want to be, or as I probably should? I just want to do things my way. Or you know, it's easier to sin on my own, or someone let me down, or someone hurt me. So therefore, I know together is better than alone, but I choose alone at times, and maybe always, but often, just times you choose to be alone. You don't want to include people in that. Because of what? And by the way, that list is not exhaustive. Maybe you have your own reason why. I would invite you, write it down. Because I think it's important for us to identify why we choose alone if we're ever gonna venture into the realm of being together in a godly, healthy way that God suggests. Um, By the way, the temptation to be alone is nothing new. It's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 10. But their temptation to be alone was slightly different. Listen to this. I'm in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Whether you have a digital Bible, paper Bible, look at the scripture real quick. Hebrews 10, 32. It says this. Remember those early days after you had received the light, meaning you had become a Christian, you accepted Jesus. Once you became a Christian, it says, when you endured a great conflict full of suffering. What? Do you remember back the days when you became a Christian and you suffered greatly? It goes on to say, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Why would a Christian in the the first century, these Hebrew Christians, why would they want to be alone? Because if they were, went to a public place and gathered with other believers in a church atmosphere, they were recognized by the Jews as traitors to the Jewish faith. Remember, this, this book is called Hebrews. It's written by this preacher to a group of people who were Christians but grew up in this Jewish faith, this Hebrew faith. If they gathered with these Christians, they would believe to be Jewish traitors and traitors to the Roman government as well. 
and they would be persecuted. The reason they didn't want to do what you're doing today is because it's a threat of their life, threat of their property, physical harm. It's in your notes this way. Alone was a temptation for the first century Hebrew Christians because of persecution and suffering. <laughs> Doesn't it make it a little embarrassing when we don't gather, when we don't get known, when we remain private or we stay away from church? Because for very few of us in this room, could we read that scripture and say, oh yeah, that's me. Now, there's a couple of you probably. That you grew up a certain faith, a certain religion, and when you gave your life to Jesus, you became a Christian. Your family rejected you, denied you, disowned you. They had a funeral in your name, even though you're still alive, because you were dead to them. Some of you have been through that. I, I admire that. Because what it took for you to become a Christian was a whole lot more than what it took for me to become a Christian. But the temptation to remain alone is thousands of years old. And it's in this room as well. And then he makes this statement about what life could be like if we were really together. I mean, not just gathered in the same room, but not private, not anonymous, together and known. And here, here's where it speaks to it. Chapter 10, verse 24. Go up a little bit higher from where we were just at. Life together could be like this. This is what he writes. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. It's Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Here's what I want to do. I'm just going to break down each word. He says this, consider it. When you think about this, he, the whole scripture is about encouraging one another and not stop meeting together, but he says, I want you to consider this. The, the word invites us to think don't just gather together, but gather together with intention, with thoughtful intention, not just thoughtless deeds. I wrote it this way. When we gather together, are we thinking about other people or are we thinking about ourselves? <laughs> what were you thinking about when you walked in today? I hope they sing the songs I like or I hope they don't sing that one song I don't like. I hope someone talks to me. I hope I don't feel alone. I hope that they have that creamer in the cafe area because I really like that creamer and sometimes they have it and sometimes they don't. I know some of you are thinking, people think that way? Yes, they do. Sometimes they'll say it out loud to us. And I'm just, did you think though, when you walk through these doors, I wonder who I'll run into today. I wonder if there's gonna be someone sitting next to me in the row who, well, never mind. No one ever sits next to each other, right? Like, have you ever walked in a row and there's someone sitting in church and there's a chair there and like you sit right in the chair next to them? They're gonna be like, you're in my space. No, I'm sitting in this chair. No, no, you don't understand. The social bubble is this is your chair and then there's a bubble chair between you and you have to sit here, right, right? But did you think at all when you walked in today to go, I wonder who could use some encouragement? I wonder who I'll speak to, to be an encouraging to. I, I wonder if there's someone coming today that I would be able to help, just maybe be a listening ear to. Most of us, we don't consider that. What we do is we walk in, and we're cordial, and we're polite. And he says this, I want you to consider how to encourage each other. That word, how, what an amazing word. The word how is when we gather together, do we give thoughtless cordialities or consider how people might receive encouragement? Let me explain it this way. Um, I've given this illustration uh, before in church, and it's such a fantastic illustration, um, but I don't have enough time to, to actually do it, so I'm going to explain it to you. Years ago, I did this. There was a couple sitting right over here, and Jason and Bronwyn were their names, good friends of ours. Jason's about 6'4", Big, strong guy, ex-Navy SEAL. And I asked him, I said, Jason, would you stand up for just a moment? He stood up, and, and I grabbed a football. And I said, Jason, catch this. <laughs> threw it right to him. Tight spiral. It was perfect. Because, man, if you throw a duck in service and everybody's watching, you're like, you got to trade in your man card. So, boom, I zip one right to him. He catches it. He's like, throw that back to me. <laughs> I caught it. It's one of those. I was just glad I caught it, right? You know, guys, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So I caught it, and I was like, uh, Bronwyn, would you stand up? Bronwyn is his, his wife. She, ugh. she's eight and a half months pregnant. And I'm like, hey, Bronwyn, catch this. No, 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 no. <laughs> I didn't do that. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? I mean, what if I hit her or hurt her or hits the baby? I mean, I, 
I threw it to her like, I mean, I came down here like this. I was like, here, 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 catch this. And she caught it. And I think she was a little offended. She's like, oh, you don't think I can catch that? You know, I said, Bronwyn, throw that back to me. She goes, <laughs> Oh, thanks. Um, why wouldn't I throw it to her the same way I threw it to him? It's not a sexist thing. She's eight and a half months pregnant, people. I'm going to throw it to her in such a way that she will catch it. Everyone who's married, you get this. Do you throw encouragement to your spouse just however you want to? Of course not. There's a whole book written on this called Love Languages. Your spouse might have the love language of uh, they feel loved by receiving a gift. So you might give them words of encouragement, and they're like, oh, thanks. They're like, no, 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 no. I was encouraging you in that moment. Oh, well, you're speaking a different language. They want to receive gifts. Other people, it's, it's words of encouragement. So you have to throw your encouragement in such a way that they're going to receive it. Some of your, your spouses or the people that you know in your family, they receive like, uh, encouragement through touch. And it's that affirmation. And so you have to throw it in a way that they'll receive it. The scripture says, consider then how you might spur one another on. Did anybody walking in here this morning think, you know what, I really want to encourage this one person, but I need to think through and consider how I might encourage them. Consider how you might encourage one another. And it says this, consider how you might spur one another on towards love and good deed. That word spur, it's actually a violent word. It's a physically confrontational word. Uh, the, the next type of word, the best synonym for it would probably be to provoke someone. I dare you to. I'm, I'm going to make you do this. Here we go. I'm going to provoke you. I'm going to spur you. It's not this gentle, soft little like, well, hey, if you want to. I hope you might. Let me just be really gentle with this. And I, I'm just, it, it's a spur. I consider, consider how you might provoke the people around you towards what? Love and good deeds. Not to feel better, but provoke them to do something in the name of love, in the name of Christ, and do good deeds. I, I just wrote this in your notes. A mature church is not defined by how much they know, but by how they love and contribute to others. That's the part where you're supposed to say amen. Because that, a mature church... Sometimes we think it's because, oh, we got members here that have been here for 54 years. No, 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 no. Maturity has nothing to do with how long you've been following Christ. Maturity is not based off of what you know alone. Information and knowledge is critically important to maturing in Christ, but it's not the sign of maturity. The sign of maturity is how you love God and love others. That would have been another great chance for you to say amen, but it's okay. You're just getting warmed up. I get it. And then it makes this statement. Consider how you might spur and provoke one another towards love and good deeds. And then it says this, not giving up meeting together. Can I just ask you a blunt question? What keeps you from gathering every Sunday? What, what keeps you from gathering in a community group? I mean, it's not because we are short on informing you that we have community groups. It's not because we're short on informing you of how to get involved in one. Maybe you haven't found the right one. If you tried four of them, awesome, keep trying. You'll find one that, that, that is great for you. But what keeps you from meeting together? Well, why do we meet? I'm going to tell you this. It's to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Um, Kent Hughes is a pastor and a writer who helps us grapple with the concept of what it looks like to be together. And he says this. He says, we meet Christ in a special way in corporate worship. And let me stop there for just a minute and explain it to you. How many of you have ever been to um, an amazing concert before? Christian, non-Christian, doesn't matter, but you went to a concert, thousands of people all around you, and you all stood together singing out the same words to the same song that you've been singing forever, and it's like, it's a deeply spiritual experience, and it's just like, oh, we're all together. And it could be a totally ungodly concert, but you're having this spiritual moment, right? You could sing that same song in your car, by yourself, and belt it out, and it's not the same experience. I, I'm just telling you that as a Christian, you can YouTube a worship song and sit at your desk and sing a, a Christian song. It's not the same thing as when we gather together, and Christ even says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. He's talking about his presence when people gather in his name. Kent Hughes goes on to say this, it is true that a person does not have to go to church to be a Christian. 
He does not have to go home to be married either. But in both cases, if he does not, he will have a very poor relationship. You don't have to go home to be married, do you? You don't have to show up to church to be a Christian. Try not showing up to either one and see how those relationships go. I think he's being really pointed. Don't stop meeting together. The word choice is interesting. When it says don't stop, you know what the word means? It means to abandon. Don't abandon the people around you. Man, this is getting a little more, a little more pointed. Like when he says, hey, just don't stop showing up to church. That's different than what the Greek holds. And he says, don't abandon one another. Well, pastor, listen, I wasn't abandoning or deserting anybody. I was just been busy, you know, been, had things to do. There's not one of us who can say, according to these first century Christians, hey, you know what, I didn't show up because I'm afraid of persecution. I showed up because I didn't show up because there was this really cool event in Napa we wanted to go to. It was really cool. It was like a two-day event, Saturday, Sunday, so we went. Like, by the way, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just explaining to you what it is that he's encouraging from the first century and I think it's really interesting that church attendance has been an issue for 2,000 years. <laughs> That's what he's saying. And he's, he also says, um, don't stop meeting together. And he says, as some are in the habit of doing. This has been going on for more than 2,000 years. There's some reason why people want to not gather together and be known and be encouraging each other. Even though we believe that together is better than alone, there's reasons why we choose alone. Um, for me, I didn't plan this this way, okay? I'm just telling you. Months ago, we thought, you know what, we're going to teach our way through the book of Hebrews, and it'll be good. But for some reason, this message landed on this Sunday. And this Sunday, I'm 10 days away from taking a sabbatical. You know what that is? That means I'm not here for two months. In our church, we have our policy for our pastors. If you've been on staff for seven years, you're required to take a sabbatical. Time off, you are not to work. It is for rest and restoration. Because people, if you know this, some of you work in the service industry, particularly the care service industry where you're helping people. Um, you get this empathy burnout. And you, you either have to leave your job and go somewhere else, or you just quit that profession and start something else. That's actually not by design. By design, you actually need rest. And so I'm taking a sabbatical. It's my second one. I've been here 15 years now. I was disobedient one year, okay? Um, so this is my second, seventh year sabbatical. And so I started on June 6th. You know what the pastor's greatest fear is, on, is in his sabbatical? Is that the whole church takes a sabbatical. So I'm just telling you, God in his wisdom, 10 days before I leave for my sabbatical, is speaking to you to say, do not stop meeting together. <laughs> I thought I'd be really subtle about it and just encourage you to say, hey, listen, consider how you might spur one another on towards love and good deeds and not stop meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. By the way, I think it's ironic it's Memorial Weekend. Memorial Weekend historically is the worst attended worship service of the year. But you are all here. That's awesome. The people who need to hear it aren't here. They will podcast this though. And they're feeling deep shame right now. God bless them. <laughs> and so it finishes, finishes with this. It says, encourage one another. Here's the real question I want to land on. Who will you encourage? Not who could you encourage? Who will you encourage? Can I invite you, for those of you who like invitations? And can I challenge those of you who like challenges to write a name down? Maybe they're here today, maybe they're not. Write two names down. Write three names down of someone you will encourage. Not can encourage, will encourage. It might be today, it might be tomorrow. If you got three names down, man, you got a great project for the week. Because this is not a mild suggestion in the text. This is a command of God that says, consider, think it through. How you will encourage, how will you spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And don't stop meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But all the more, encourage one another. So when you write their name down, I then want you to think, God how do I encourage them? How will they best receive it? How do I throw encouragement their way? 
And maybe specifically, you might consider, if a name comes to mind, um, about those who are not here right now. Where are they? Because I'm just telling you, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, but I know that people who wander from God, the first place they wander from is church. Because they don't want to be around Christians if they're actually wandering from God in their life. So who will you encourage? Do you have a name written down? I'm going to give you a little bit of time to do that. As you do that, um, let me describe a situation to you. The Liverpool Football Club. I don't know if you watched this match yesterday. Yesterday they played in the European Championship soccer match. I think that's the right title, something like that. Um, they played yesterday. This is the crest for their team. Liverpool Football Club. Um, not soccer, just so we understand. Football club. This is their motto at the very top. You'll never walk alone. Have you ever seen what happens in the stadium before a game? Their colors are red, field of red people. They hold up their scarves, and before the game, they sing this song, some of them at the top of their lungs. This song is called, You'll Never Walk Alone. It's the sign of this amazing unity of the team. Let me read to you the words. I won't sing it, don't worry. But let me read to you the, the lyrics to this song. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high, and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm, there's a golden sky, and the sweet silver song of a lark Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain. Though your dreams be tossed and blown, walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone, you'll never walk alone. Walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone, you'll never walk alone. It's an amazing song, isn't that? It feels like a, I mean, if, if soccer, excuse me, football was a, a, a worship, I mean, that, it was a God, like, that's a worship service there. Can you imagine a whole stadium of people shouting that? That's amazing. The problem was yesterday, their goalie made two catastrophic errors. He got the ball as the opponent was coming out, he got the ball, and he went to go feed it out to his right over here. He took that ball and fed it, but he showed where he was going to throw the ball. He fed it right here, and a, the opponent just stepped right in front of him, lunged out, kicked their leg, and he threw it right into his foot, and it bounced back, and it was a goal. It was like one of the biggest... It was one of the biggest bonehead plays by a goalie you'll ever see in the history of football. And he felt terrible. And you know what happens with a goalie whose nerves get rocked like that. They're bound to make another mistake. Gareth Bale shot at him on goal. This ball, it knuckled a little bit. But he's like 40 yards out, shoots it. It's like right for his hands. And you just see the goalie. It blows through his hands and goes in the goal. Gives up a second goal. They lose the game three to one. And this is the goalie at the end of the game. <laughs> Though your dreams be tossed and blown, walk on, walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone. You'll never walk alone. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone. You'll never walk alone. Until you screw up so bad no one wants to be with you. <laughs> that goalie at the end of the game was all alone. I thought it was an interesting illustration for church life. That we can stand and sing and preach and pretend like we can look at each other and be like, you're never alone. We're together, we're together, we're together until your worst hour. And then you feel all alone. And sometimes it's hardest to walk with people in their worst hour as opposed to their best hour. In our minds, we think, oh, I love that person. They're great. I'd love to be with them. But what you're really meaning is I'd love to be with them when they're at their best. Are we willing to be with people when they're at their worst or when they've experienced their worst? Um, I was running my message over in my head yesterday, and uh, I got a text from somebody about 10 in the morning, and it was a text from uh, someone on our staff was saying, oh, my spouse is an ICU. I've been here all night, and... We came in last night late, and we've been there, and I didn't ask for permission to share this, so I'm not going to tell you who it is. But. So they just shared with me, like, this is where we're at. We're at the hospital right now. So I text back, like, who's with you? What's happening? I mean, give me, give me some details. And so they, they shared some details, and they said this. They said, I'm fine. Don't come down here. I know this person. I know what they meant. They meant, I'm an emotional wreck right now. I don't want you around me. <laughs> You get like this, don't you? Some of you do. Some of you, when you, some of you are an emotional wreck, you would rather have somebody there that you trust and know. But other times, I mean, sometimes there's just moments like, I just don't want anybody else around. And I knew that that was kind of the situation. So I 
tolerated that for the morning. And the more I thought about my message for today, I'm about to go into a message on Sunday saying together is better than alone, and then I knew that the situation had happened, and if I let them be alone, I could not do that. And so I went down there in the afternoon and just sat for a little bit, and um, they were actually on their way out. Things had turned and progressed and gotten better. Um, But you could tell even when someone said, no, 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 I'd rather be alone, there was a spirit of thankfulness when you show up, particularly when people feel at their worst. Now, I'm just telling you this. If you go into the hospital, I might not show up, okay? I can't do it for everybody. But I want to do it for a few, what I wish I could do for everybody. I don't know what your list looks like if you have a name written down. Maybe you have 10 names down. You can't do that in seven days. Not and consider and think through, and instead of just being cordial or polite or a, hey, quick, hey, how you doing? I mean, to really think through how would you encourage that person? How would you spur them on towards love and good deeds? You can't do 10, but you can do for the few what you wish you could do for the many. You can do for the few what you wish you could do for the many. So do for the few, because some of us go, I can't do it for everybody, so I'm not going to do it for anybody. I think we're actually being disobedient to God's scriptures when we choose not to encourage, when we choose not to gather together, And when we choose not to be open with each other and known. That was my my situation yesterday. I I know for some of you, you think, listen, listen, my church experience is this. I show up on Sunday, and I am good. Like it here, having a good time, appreciate most of the messages. Um, Like the music, I, I, I love coming in here. People are nice to me and polite. I don't know too many people yet, but... That's my church experience. And some of you are thinking, if I ever find a place to belong and develop friendships here, listen, listen, it's icing on the cake. It's like bonus time in church, right? It's not what it's about. It's about me and God, right? It's about me and God, right? It's about me and God, right? You know why we think that? It's because we don't understand what is at stake. What's at stake if we're not together and we're alone? What's at stake if we allow people to be alone and not together? I don't know if you've ever seen this before. When you get to the end of that whole phrase, it says, encourage each other all the more as we see the day approaching. What day? Like, what day is that? It's judgment day. It's the day where Jesus comes back and he gathers all the people that are his. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you don't know this, look at the very next sentence here. In chapter 10, verse 26, This is about to get red hot intense. It says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Whoa. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who's trampled the Son of God underfoot, who's treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The Lord bless you and keep you. (laughs) This is a terrifying verse. And we went over this a couple weeks ago. Chapter 6 and chapter 10 have very similar verses that feel very, uh, they are warnings, but they feel very threatening. And these set of verses, I'll tell you this, are very controversial because people aren't really sure exactly what it means. And let let me just, I'm going to explain the controversy and then I'm going to tell you why it doesn't matter that much. The controversy is this. And by the way, it's not because I, some of you are going to be very disappointed. Don't send me an email on this week, this week, okay? Um. I understand the controversy. I could articulate it for a couple hours to you. I'm choosing not to. And here's why. Let me me show it to you real quick. On one side it says this. Well, does it say that people are going to hell? Or does it say that if they're a Christian that they're just going to experience some bad things on earth? And the second part of that is to say, um, are the people really, are they Christians who he's writing to? Or are they non-Christians? Because here's the problem. This verse seems to say and sound like These are Christians that he's writing to, and he's saying, if you don't stay with God, be careful, you could lose your salvation. 
If you think you're all good with Jesus, you could end up in hell if you deliberately keep on sinning. Oh, (laughs) room got quiet. Go back today, read that section again. A lot of people have, have said, yeah, you know what, you could totally lose your faith and, and end up in hell. And some of you, you've been taught by priests or pastors that. Here, here's what I'm going to tell you. Other people, they say this, they say, oh, no, 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 you can never lose your faith. But maybe you could walk away from God. And so, therefore, the people, you, since you can't lose your faith, there's no way that he's speaking to Christians in here. So all the Christians go, oh, good, this then doesn't apply to me. That's the controversy. Can I tell you why it doesn't matter? Well, let me show you this. Take a look at this warning sign. I showed you this a couple weeks ago. What does it say? It says there's a steep grade ahead. There's some curves ahead. So here's what you need to do. Slow down. Go this speed limit. Because if you go this speed limit, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be able to stay in your designed lane, the place that will keep you safe, and you will arrive safely if you stay in your lane. I'm going to tell you this. In your life, God has a lane for you. It is the safe place, the right speed, and he's just saying... This is a warning sign for you that together is better than alone because when you're alone, we tend to venture into crazy ideas about who God is. We respond from our hurt, not our health. We tend to believe lies as opposed to truth. When we're alone, we can get really messed up. And so it doesn't, this is a, let me say it this way. This is a very clear warning sign that there are clear and present dangers to our soul. If you're writing notes, write that last one down. Together is better than alone because there's a clear and present danger to our soul. Here's where I want you to get this. Why doesn't any of that matter? Whether it's a Christian or a non-Christian, whether the penalties are here now or the penalties are for eternity, here's why it doesn't matter. What he's saying is stay in your lane. Stay in your lane with God. Life together is better than alone because there are significant, critical consequences to your soul. Will it change your behavior or how you handle this, whether he's writing to Christians or non-Christians? No, it doesn't change your behavior. There's still a warning sign that says this, be together, encourage each other, spur each other on towards love and good deeds. Does it matter whether the, the consequences are here now or in eternity? Will it change your behavior? No, it won't. People get so caught up in the conflict that they miss the message that life together is so much better than life alone because life alone People tend to wander away from God in life alone. I will give you a hint to my beliefs on this, that I do believe that people cannot lose their salvation. It is God's adoption of your soul. His ability to hang on to you is way more powerful than your ability to hang on to him. People get hung up on that if you deliberately keep on sinning. Let me just tell you this. You will keep on sinning this side of heaven. Congratulations. You're in a room full of sinners but we also know is grace. There's there's a really famous message called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God written by Jonathan Edwards. And um, one pastor describes it this way. Jonathan Edwards gave his people a whiff of the sulfurs of hell that they might deeply inhale the fragrances of grace. This passage isn't designed for you to walk outside and be so afraid that God is gonna send you to hell. It's not what this is for. It's to say life together is way better than alone, but there is a clear and present danger to all of our souls, whether the danger is here and now or the danger is in eternity. He's saying, I have a lane for you marked by grace and forgiveness. Stay in that lane. Stay safe and do it together because what's at stake is people's eternities. Question for you, who's not here today? How are they doing and does anybody know? And if you look around this room, truth be told, there'll be people missing next week, next month, next year. Will anybody go after them? Jesus tells a really good story about a shepherd who leaves 99 sheep to go after one. Are we the kind of people that will live out together is better than alone? Because there is a clear and present danger for our souls. So consider how you might spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And don't stop meeting together, particularly when the pastor takes sabbatical. And encourage each other all the more as we see that day of Jesus approaching. Amen? Bow your heads. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. There's some parts that we just admit we don't get, we don't understand. There can be a couple different ways to understand it. And God, we just bow before you that we're not going to get it all. But the things you make clear, God, we want to focus on that. And we know the truth is this, that together 
Life together, known, not anonymous, public, not private, transparent, not hidden, is way better for us than being alone. And so, God, whatever you want these folks in this room to do, speak it to them today, and I pray that we would walk out of here with conviction and action to do life together. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.